Uh, I'm very excited to be here with you today. We're introducing a new book, uh, which uh, maybe, um, uh, not a new book, I'm, we're, we're doing the Bible, a book in the Bible. Yeah, we're doing a new book, it's called the Koran. No, um, <laughs> we're doing a book of the Bible. Uh, maybe you're relatively new to Rock Haven, but that's, that's what we do. We don't, um, uh, we don't have a sermon series or anything that tell, people tell us what we've done, but what we've done over the last 16 years is we've, we've taken a book of the Bible, we've explored those things, uh, looking for God's character, what it speaks to us. Uh, we've done that in the First Testament, in the Second Testament, or Old and New Testament, and it just happens to be that it's time for us to be in the Old Testament. And so uh, we're going to look at a new book of the Bible uh, uh, series for us, and that is the book of Kings. We're going to look at the book of Kings. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and open it to Kings. Now, many of you are thinking, ah, John's messed up already because it's first and second kings, not just one. Ah, I didn't mess up. I knew that. But the fact of the matter is, is that once upon a time, it used to all be one book. It was just the book of kings. That's what it was. And um, so we're going to look at that and we're going to study it as we do. And as you have God's word open, I would ask, would you please pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much, again, remaining thankful for who you are and what you have done for us and the gift that you've given us in your word. As we open up your word, it is an action, Lord, that we do to demonstrate our need of you, that we are indeed dependent upon your word, your wisdom, to know your ways, and Lord, what it is that you would like to do different in our lives. I'd ask for your blessing on this group of people who seek you in your word, not just today, but in the days and weeks to come, that your Holy Spirit would minister to their hearts and minds, and that you would lead and guide each of us in accordance with your wisdom. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for what you are and will do. In Jesus' name, amen. Sometime back, if you've been with us, you remember uh, we studied the book of First and Second Samuel. Do you remember that? Some, yeah, we do. Yay! People remember. Uh, we studied First and Second Samuel, and when we did, we we looked at the uh, you know basically the journey of King David. King David is Israel's greatest king, greatest king, beloved king. As we go through all the Testament, uh, excuse me, as we go through all of God's redemptive story, and you look over and over again in the New Testament, it's quote, and King David, King David, King David. And so we have this over and over and over again. As we study the book of Kings, we come into the zenith of that reign of Israel. And King David handing the throne to his son Solomon. And we're going to look at that as we go. But in order to understand everything that's going to unfold in front of us, I guess I'd, I'd, like, to, I'd like to look at a, a summary, if you will, of some of the things that we studied in uh, the book of Samuel. And so even though you've got your Bible open to Kings, leave it there, all right? Just listen to me as I read uh, the history of David, which will help put into context our study for today. Okay, so um, David is, David is uh, in, uh, he's king, you know, he's defeated Saul, all of those things are taken care of. And as David is king, he's purposed in his heart uh, to build God a temple. And as he is purposing his heart to build God a temple, the prophet Nathan says, sure, whatever seems right in your heart, go ahead and do it. Uh, but one of the things that occurred then is that God comes to Nathan and says, er, stop, David can't be doing that. And so go and tell David, thus says the Lord. And that's where we picked it up. I pick it up to share with you this history of God's own words in 2 Samuel, where um, the Lord said, would you build me a house to dwell in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent for my dwelling. In all the places where I have moved with all the people of Israel, did I speak a word with any of the judges of Israel whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built for me a house of cedar? As we go through this study of the book of Kings, it will be no different 
than any other study of any other book of the Bible that we look at as we look at the revealed character of God and what He wants to teach us. We will talk specifically about the promise of God, the presence of God, the power of God, and the provision of God as we go through the book of Kings. But what I want you to see right here and right now is that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And what God has said, what David purposed in his heart, he said, Lord, i got to give you a house so everybody can know and everybody can see. And more important to God than houses of cedars or temples or possessions or anything, revealed to us by God himself, is people. God loves people. And he makes it his aim for us to know that love and to experience that love that providence, that shepherding, that leading, that guiding, that delivering, that saving. That's what he wants to do. The Lord then went on to say to David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, David, I took you from the pasture, from, being, uh, from following sheep, that you should be prince over my people Israel. Do you remember that story? Do you remember that? David, David, the, the youngest of all of his brothers, right? Little David. He's, he's left to, sh to take care of the sheep. His brothers all went off to fight wars, and David was left to take care of the sheep, and he's taking care of sheep. We got mighty stories of David being a shepherd and this and that and the other, but he was first and foremost a shepherd. And he shows up, sent by his dad to bring supplies to his brothers to this battle, and as he gets there, there's this giant Philistine named Goliath, and nobody will fight him. And Dave's like, what are you guys doing, you men of little faith? I'll do it. Remember what happens? God uses David. He kills Goliath, and that's the stepping pieces that bring David about to be a king. God said, it was me. I did that. I took you from following sheep and I made you prince of Israel. We continue to go through God's account to David and you will see all of the I have been's and I wills. God went on to say, I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all of your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. And violent men shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all of your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. And when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up for you an offspring after you who shall come from your own body, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forevermore. And I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And when he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the sons of men. But from my steadfast love, I will not depart from him. As I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure before me. And your throne shall be established forevermore in accordance with all these words God spoke to David. As we go through the study of the book of Kings, we will see an incredible overlap, not only of what I'm reading here in Solomon, but we'll also have a record recorded for us in Chronicles. We have over 400 years from Kings chapter 1 to the end of 2 Kings. 400 years. 41 kings. 14 prophets. Many of those prophets who have written us books as well. And so we're going to study this journey together and we're going to look at God's incredible promises to fulfill what God said he will fulfill. And when God is speaking to David, he says, you're not going to build me out, but your son will build me a temple and I will establish his throne forever and ever and ever. We know that everything that we've just celebrated in the past holidays through the Christmas season that we are celebrating in Matthew chapter 1, the line and lineage of Jesus Christ himself, Amen. who comes from the kingdom of David. And so we will look to these things as we go through. And what we will see is God's faithfulness in accomplishing his purposes, even though things are going to get pretty bad. See, because in the book of Kings, what we have is we have, we begin the story in a fantastic position, the highest point. 
Yes, God took David out of, the, out of the pasture and he made him a prince of Israel. And what David did is he took all of the tribes of Israel, divided and warring factions, and he brought them all together as one unified kingdom. And David is one king over the entire nation of Israel. And it's a time of peace and all their enemies are vanquished. And one last thing to do is to build the temple and Solomon will do it. As Solomon does these things, then in just one generation, things will begin to fall apart. But we will look at the promises of God. We will look at the difference His presence makes, His power, and His, His provision. You see, what happens is, is that these people will get caught up in the divinic dynasty. That means they're going to get all caught up in who they are because we're with God, okay? And they're going to get all caught up in the fact that they have this temple now. Now we have a temple. And they have the Torah, and they're going to look to all of these things, but what they're going to do is they're going to neglect the God of those things. And in neglecting Him in just one generation, they're going to go from their zenith to a divided, fragmented, and horrible situation. Great, John! Why would we want to study that? <laughs> because we live in a day and an age where things aren't getting better. Okay? When it pertains to the things of God, there are people who are growing more and more hostile. We live in a day and an age where we look around at ourselves and we say, yeah, I believe that God sent His Son Jesus so I could have life everlasting, but... and fill in the blank about the but. We look at our circumstances. We look to our religious leader. We look to our faith organization. We look to our government. We look to this. We look to that. We look to all these other things to change our circumstances. And what really what we need to look at is we need to look at God himself and who he says we are and that conduct ourselves in accordance with his word, not the wisdom of the world. Amen. And so we're going to look at those things as they are revealed to us in this account. And in that account, what we're going to see, as I said before, we're going to see God at work fulfilling his promises, the very promise that he made to Abraham, the promise that he made to David. And he told David, I will raise up for you an offspring. He told him that in 2 Samuel chapter 7, before Samuel was even, or excuse me, Solomon was even born. Solomon, Solomon isn't actually even born until 2 Samuel uh, verse 13. Another time we'll share some of the reasons why and those things that go along with that. But again, as a point of historic context, I want to share with you right now today, right, so that there's no doubt or wonder who the next king is going to be. I'm going to share with you David's charge to the nation of Israel in 1 Chronicles chapter 28, where David says to all of Israel, David rose to his feet and he said, Hear me, my brothers and my people. I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the Ark of the Covenant and the Lord. And the covenant, excuse me, Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, and for the footstool of our God. And I made preparations for the building. But God said to me, you may not build a house for my name, for you are a man of war and have shed much blood. That's David's legacy. God wants to do something different in peace. Yet the Lord God of Israel chose me from all my father's house to be king over Israel forever. For he chose Judah as leader in the house of Judah, my father's house. And among my father's sons, he took pleasure in me to make me king of all Israel. And of all my sons, <laughs> for the Lord has given me many. He has chosen Solomon, my son, to sit on the throne of the king of the Lord over Israel. He said to me, it is Solomon, your son, who shall build my house and my courts. For I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. And I will establish his kingdom forever. If he continues strong in keeping my commandments and my rules as he is today. Solomon, by God's design, Solomon is to be the next king of Israel. Solomon is the second son of David and Bathsheba. And you will read and we will study more about that significance. All right, now here we are, understanding the context of where we get to our study of the book of Kings. Look with me at Kings chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. 
Now, King David was old and advanced in years. And that still makes me chuckle. I read it in the first service. I had to read it again. It still makes me chuckle. It's, it's like you can't be one without the other, I guess. He's old and advanced in years. And although they covered him with clothes, he could not get warm. David is on his deathbed. At the end of, and I'm so very thankful for God's word and how it's structured. At the end of 2 Samuel, uh, David has numbered all of the mighty men of Israel. Uh, it was sin against the Lord. He confesses that sin. He repents and, and, is offered, and then boom, the, the book ends. Okay? As we go through the study of Chronicles, we get to it. The last words of David are an incredible song of blessing intermixed with all of these fantastic uh, truths about God's character and David's desire for the nation of Israel and to bless them. And, and it's beautiful and it's flowing, right? And it's the last words of King David. But here at the beginning of this book, 1 Kings 1, 1, David is on his deathbed. So weak so frail that he can't even warm up with lots and lots of blankets. Right. <laughs> lots and lots of blankets. And so something needs to be done. Verse 2, Therefore his servants said to him, Let a young woman be sought for the Lord our king, and let him let her wait on the king and be in his service. Let her lie in your arms that the Lord may be warm. So they sought for a beautiful woman throughout all the territory of Israel and found Abishag the Shunammite and brought her to the king. And the young woman was very beautiful, and she was a service to the king and attended to the king, but the king knew her not. I was talking to some people this week about, you know, introducing the book of Kings. And the first comment was, well, what are you going to do with chapter one? I said, what do you mean? What am I going to do with chapter one? Well, when they bring this beautiful young woman to the king to lay with him, keep warm. It's like, yeah, and your point is what? If your first thought of this encounter is somehow a, a, an inappropriate intimacy, that's a sin issue. It, what I mean by that is, 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 is that it's, it's wrong. We shouldn't think about it that way. This is before the days of electric blankets and, and, um, and, and heating pads, okay? And the king is cold. And everybody, all of them around him are all his peers. They're all getting older. They're all getting older. And, and when you think about the king, this, this is still David, fully the king. He is, he is convalescent. He's on his deathbed, but he is still the king of Israel. And the king has presented all the very best things. They didn't eat on regular clay or wooden dishes. They had, they had gold and silver and bronze. They didn't, they didn't get just par gifts. I mean, they got the best of the best of whatever the world had. And so in order to continue to honor, his servants are saying, we are going to give you someone young that can wait on you, who can serve you, who can keep you warm, who can do all of these. And she did that. And she's mentioned by name. Her name is given because she faithfully served the king. And there was no hanky-panky. There was nothing weird about it. And there was nothing. She did what she was supposed to do. She waited on him. She served him. She attended to his convalescent needs. She was the best of all nurses. And because they didn't have heated blankets and heating pads and electric blankets, then she would curl up and lay next to him to keep him warm. Because she wanted to honor him. Because he was still the king of Israel. Just a fact. That's what took place. This is what's going on inside the king's house. But what we're going to read next is what's going on on the outside of the king's house. A group of people in the king's house still honoring the king. Still desiring to pay him tribute and to make sure that he's entitled to all that the king of Israel is entitled to. On the outside of the house, one of his own family conspiring against him. Look with me at verse 5. Now Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared for himself chariots of horses, 50 men to run before him. His father had never at any time displeased him by asking him, why have you done thus and so? He was also very handsome, and he was born next after Absalom. So he conferred with Joab, the son of Zerulah, and Abathar the priest, and they followed Adonijah and helped him. But Zodak the priest, and Benaiah the son of Jodiah, and Nathan the prophet, and Shimei, and Ray, and David's mighty men were not with Adonijah. Whew. 
On my phone, I have a little app, okay? And on that app, on that app, I can type in the phrase, how do you pronounce? And then I spell it, A-D-O-N, right? I spell out, I, I'm really bad at all of these Hebrew names, okay? You, you're probably really good with them, but I'm, I'm really bad at them. So if I confidently pronounce one of these Hebrew names like Adonijah, that's because I've typed it in my phone and I hit the little button and it plays and it goes, Adonijah. And then I say, Adonijah. Okay, the, I hit it again, Adonijah. And then I say, Adonijah, right? Okay, but I do not do that with all of the names, right? And you caught that. That's why I just called some person in the Bible, Shimmy. Okay, I, I don't think that's how that's pronounced. But what I want to do is I want you to know that I am not paying, I don't mean it to be disrespectful whatsoever to anybody whose name is listed in the Bible. If names are listed in the Bible, they're important. It's just that I don't have time to go through 14 different Hebrew names, type them into my phone, listen to it, and then phonetically put it in my notes, okay? So God knows my heart, and I pray you do too, that when you look at those, realize that names are recorded in the Bible are significant. And this one young woman who was willing to serve the king, her name is gonna be brought up again in the story, it's significant. And when we look at King David's son, Adonijah, and the people that he surrounded himself with, it's significant. Now what's said of this story and how we get here are important, right? Here's the king, here's the king, and God has made the king a promise. And we read it, and the promise is, the promise is that Solomon will be king after you. Right? But son number whatever in the birth order three, okay? This is Absalom's little brother. You guys remember Absalom? Absalom was David's firstborn son, gorgeous guy, rock star personality. Everybody loved him. Decided to overtake his father and be king one day. Absalom's now dead. That's how it worked out for him, okay? And Adonijah's next in line. That's, that's what it amounts to. Now, Adonijah's got his own following. It says he's a pretty good looking guy himself. He's got some possessions. Some things work really well. He's sitting around one day. His dad's on his deathbed and he's looking at the nation of Israel. And he says, well, hey, Makes sense. I'm up next. I'll be king. Now, I don't know. I don't know, right? We could give him the benefit of the doubt and say, well, maybe he wasn't there that day when his dad said, behold, all of Israel, Solomon's going to be the next king. And behold, all Israel of all my sons, and I have many, Solomon will be the next king. Maybe Adonis just was like, oh, sorry, I was homesick that day. Maybe he didn't know that, but I think he did. Okay, I think he did. And the reason I think he did is because of his actions. Did you see who he goes and he talks to? He says, he conferred, he conferred. He said, I'll be king. And he went and conferred with Joab and Abathar. Now, Joab, we remember reading about in Samuel. Joab, both of these men, both of these men are power hungry. They're aspiring men. Uh, Joab, uh, he's the commander of, of, of King David's army. Uh, he uh, uh, one time got in trouble with David because he went out and a guy that killed his brother, he exacted revenge during a time of peace. And David said, we don't do that, but I'll let you live. And all of these kind of things. You know, so da Joab is very power hungry. And Abathar, the priest, he comes from the line of Eli. It's another story, another time, another place. But both of these men, actually what's interesting about it is, is that they can't get any higher in their role and position in Israel than where they're at. I mean, they're at the top spots of where they're at. They, they can't advance anymore, but the king's going to die. So in order to preserve their spot, they're like, hey, yeah, we'll, we'll roll with you. We'll roll with you. Now, because that was unbeknownst or because of this or because of that, it's more nefarious than that. Because they specifically, when they decide to have this king-making party, they don't invite Solomon. And they don't invite the people who might tell them, you're not working in accordance with God's promise and his will. <clears throat> Application lesson number one. Who do you confer with? Where do you seek counsel? Do you look on your Facebook following? Do you go to Channel 5 for Oprah? Do you seek it from like-minded people like yourself? Or do you seek it in accordance with godly wisdom, his word, in his way? That's a question we have to ask ourselves. Because Adonijah, 
had every access to God's promise, every access to the Torah, every access to the prophets, every access, but he went and found power hungry men to say, yeah, you can do this. And if we're honest, sometimes when we're wrestling with the thing, we find people that'll tell us what we want to hear. And then we say, see, I'm right. Let's not be like that. Let's, let's be people that first and foremost confer with the Lord in accordance with his word, through prayer and his word. If you've got questions, right? If you've got questions, let's talk about it together. Let's confer with people who, are, who, who we know and who have professed that they are also faithful followers of Jesus. So that the wisdom that we mutually are pursuing is godly wisdom. Adonijah didn't do that. What he does is in verse 9. <clears throat> uh, Adonijah sacrificed sheep, oxen, fatted calves, and serpent stone, which is beside and roll. And he invited all of his brothers, the king's sons, and all the royal officials of Judah. But he did not invite Nathan, the prophet, Benoni, the mighty man, or Solomon, his brother. Why? Because he didn't care what they had to say. Remember what he said in his heart? I will be king. Uh, actually, the other reason you don't invite them is because when you put these people on the hit list that you're going to kill them, it doesn't look good to bring them to a party first. Okay, but that's the deal. That's how kings were made in the day, is that if you could get everybody and their brother to jump on the bandwagon with you and say, yeah, this makes sense. Go Adonijah, go Adonijah. Yeah, you're the man. And everybody in the hoopla goes, oh, I, guess, I thought it was something. No, it's Adonijah. Oh, I guess the king must have changed his mind. Blah, 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 blah. Right? And now he's king. And then so when he's king, and now the only way to remain king is to get rid of the people that actually had the legal right to be that. So you whack them, and now they're gone. And everybody's like, oh, he just whacked the guy. He said, yeah, but he's the king. That's how they used to operate back then. Okay? Now, anyway... God's faithful to keep his promises, even when people are doing stupid things. Go ahead and look with me at how God uses Nathan in verse 11. Nathan said to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, have you not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, has become king, and David, our Lord, does not know it? Now, therefore, come and let me give you some advice. So now what's about to happen is Nathan's going to tell Bathsheba what she should do. How she go and tell the king this news that the king doesn't know anything about, and then he actually says, you're going to say it, and then I'm going to come in, and I'm going to tell him the truth, so that the testimony of two witnesses, we can share with him the truth, what's going to happen, and we'll see what David's going to do. Okay? So, ver jump down with me in verse 15. So Bathsheba went into the king in his chamber. The king was very old, uh, and the Shunammite was attending to the king. Bathsheba bowed and paid homage to the king, and the king said, what do you desire? He still loves her. She's there paying homage to her king, Bathsheba, and he loves her. What do you, my wife, desire? She said to him, verse 17, my lord, you swore to your servant by the Lord your God, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne. And now behold, Adonijah is king, although you, my lord, the king, do not know it. And he sacrificed all kinds of animals, and they're having a big party. <clears throat> Just as she's speaking, Nathan pops in. Okay? Nathan pops in. Look with me at verse 22. While she was still speaking with the king, Nathan the prophet came in. He told the king, here's Nathan the prophet. He came in, he bowed low, and he said, My lord the king, have you, not, have you said, Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? For he's gone out this day, and he sacrificed cattle, and fattened calves, sheep in abundance, and, and has invited the king's sons and commanders of the army, Abathar the priest, and behold, they're eating and drinking before him. And everyone is saying, Long live King Adonijah. <laughs> Bathsheba goes to David and says, had you not said, did I hear you correctly? That's, you remember those years ago that Solomon was to be king? Well, he hasn't been invited to a party, and so you know what that means? It means somebody else is usurping your kingdom, and they're going to kill my son. Then Nathan comes in and says, Lord, have you, King David, have you changed your mind? Have you changed your mind? There's something going on out here in the city, and I just got to know. Are you still on God's page? Have you still decided to pursue the promises of God? Or have you decided to take the easy route, the peaceful route, whatever route you want to call it? Have you, have you changed your mind because they're, they're, they're sacrificing animals like this is a, a thing you've commanded. They're, they're, they're doing all of this stuff and everybody in town's now, or a growing number of people in town are, you know, long live King Adonijah. Look with me at David's answer. 
verse 28. Then King David answered, he said, call Bathsheba to me. So now Nathan and Bathsheba are there before the king. She came into the king's presence, stood before the king, and the king swore, saying, As the Lord lives, who has redeemed my soul out of every adversity, as I swore to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, <clears throat> and he shall sit on my throne in my place. Even so will I do this this day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. This oath of David is fascinating to me because this is kind of like how David does oaths, right? You read other oaths of King David. As the Lord lives, fill in the blank. As the Lord has done for me, David's oaths are always based out of the faithfulness of the character of God. As, as, a, as surely as God is always conducting himself, this is going to happen. That's David's oaths. How it works. We'll study oaths another time, maybe. But you know what's fascinating to me is that I told you that God made God made David a promise before this son was even born. In 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 First Samuel chapter seven, God says, "I'm going to raise up a son who's going to build the temple," and then and then David's whole kingdom goes. I mean, it makes David makes a big mess because who's Solomon? So Solomon, is, Solomon is Bathsheba's kid. Who's Bathsheba? She's formerly the wife of Uriah. Who's Uriah? The guy David murdered. Okay? So that whole story happens. And then their child, the first child dies. Then he goes to Bathsheba, comforts her, and she gives birth to a son. And David names him Solomon. Right? Then... It's revealed, right, that the son that is going to be king after him is, 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 not, is not all of the kids that were born in Hebron. It's not all of the older ones. It's this one. Why? Because this is a redemptive work of God. This, this man who was wronged, his name is Uriah. His wife was stolen, taken, and he was handed orders to have himself killed in battle. That's how evil David was at that moment. Now, God forgave him and did all of those different things. But God, in his redemptive work, he said, you know what I'm going to do in light of that? Because of your confession, because of all of these things, I'm going to make his, your son, king. And this is the line and lineage of Jesus. Now, time and place will explore all of that. But here's the second life application question that I have for us. If David knew all of that for all of this time, why is he laying on his deathbed, can't keep himself warm, needs someone to care and be attentive to him, feed him, warm him, why has David not made Solomon king? Why? Why is he waiting? Is he, is he thinking he's gonna get stronger and get better? Maybe, I <laughs> mean, yeah. Why, why is David even permitted this situation for Adonijah to go like, hey, I wonder what's going to happen? I don't know. I'll just do it. Application point number two. If we are not obedient to what God asks us to do because of God's plan and promise, if we're not obedient to that, bad things will happen because evil also has an agenda. Okay? Evil has an agenda. Our enemy means to steal, kill, destroy anything that has to do with the glory of God. So, if God has prompted and stirred and worked in you to be obedient to a thing, I don't know what it is. That's between you and the Lord. Do not delay in doing it. If God has stirred or prompted or worked in you to forgive someone, do it. If God has stirred and worked within you to go somewhere, go there. If God has stirred or prompted or worked for you to volunteer to something, do it. If God has stirred or worked for you to be involved more and more in the things, then do it. Don't delay. I'm not saying our delay is sinful. Okay? I've been known to wait around a time or two myself. But I am telling you that what's on the line is evil has an agenda. But, but God 
has called and given us incredible gifts of himself so that we might be obedient to what it is that he's calling us to do. Don't delay. Take courage. Do it. Well, so now things got to change. Look with me uh, at verse 32. King David said, Called me Zodak the priest, Nathan the prophet, Ben and I, the son of Jehiah. Uh, and they came before the king. And the king said to him, Take with you servants of your Lord and have Solomon, my son, ride on my own mule and bring him down to Gahan. And let Zodak the priest and Nathan the prophet there anoint him king over Israel. Then blow the trumpet and say, Long live King Solomon. You shall then come up after him and he shall come and sit on my throne for he shall be king in my place. I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Ju Judah. And Benaiah the son of Jehoiada answered the king, Amen. May the Lord, the God of my Lord and king, uh, say so. As the Lord has been with my Lord the king, even so may he be with Solomon and make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord King David. Uh, I love that line. He says, and Benaiah said, Amen. Amen. See, people have been waiting for David to do this. That's the subpart B to our two-part application. God's asked you to be obedient, and somebody's waiting for you to be obedient. Okay? Amen. Yeah, let's get her done. And he's going to be great. And just as great a king as you are, I pray that his kingdom is as great as yours. Okay? So we're going to do it. Interestingly enough, okay? Right? Adonijah, <laughs> he is a, this makes sense. I, I'm next up. I'm pretty good looking. Dad's never said a bad word to me. I mean, David thought all his kids were awesome. Okay? But God's got a plan. And going through all of these different things. And so Adonijah, when he sets his parade up for everything, he gets 50 guys to run in front of a horse and chariot. That doesn't sound safe to me at all. But those 50 guys must have been fast. Okay? Yeah, but he's on his horse and chariot, and, and, and you know, uh, that's, that's, that's what he's doing. And, and, and again, it just starts to make sense. What are horses and chariots used for war? God's already said, you've already been a man of blood and war. You're not going to build my temple. Adonis is just thinking, this is what powerful men do. I'm going to be king. These men and warriors running ahead of me, and I've got my horse and chariot, which is very much an Egyptian thing, the whole horse and the chariot. And he's, he's there, and he's the power, and he's going to have it. And then, and then you know, the guy that God chose, chooses, chooses, right? He's, he's like, okay, now take my son Solomon out and, and bring him before the people and put him on my own donkey. So here's Ad Adonis, you know, he's riding in the chariot and his power and his hair flowing back. And here's Solomon <laughs> riding on a donkey. Yeah, not, not exactly a power picture. If you've ever tried to ride a donkey, that's not a power picture. Okay. But the thing about it is, is that what we have in, in this picture of kings on donkeys, does that sound familiar to anybody? Jesus coming into Jerusalem on a colt in which no one had ever ridden. That's because kings that rode donkeys came in peace, not war. This kingdom that God has intended is a, is a zenith of, of peace and of beautiful things. And when the world takes hold of things and wants to do things their way, there's going to be war and conflict. And when we had adhered to the things of God, one of the ways we know that God is in it is because of the peace that comes along with it. We'll talk more about that in a minute. <laughs> uh, so they did all of these things. Uh, they did all of these things. Where did it go? Oh, here it goes. Okay, uh, verse 38. So Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah the son, the Terith and the Petherite. I told you I can't pronounce all of those. Put him in a mule, and there he goes. Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. Then they blew the trumpet, and all the people said, Long live King Solomon! And all the people went up after him, playing on pipes and rejoicing with great joy, so that the earth was split by their noise. Wow! 
<laughs> I mean, everybody is now excited. Why, David? Why did you wait, Dave? Why did you wait, Dave? Why did you wait, Dave? I don't know. But everybody is excited for what God's going to do. So much, in fact, that they are all, as they're crying and as they're carrying on, right? It's as though the earth is just going to split apart from the noise. It's fantastic. Okay? Now, mind you, uh, uh, we didn't get into it, but in the locations, the locations where everybody at is Adonijah, he's, he's got his party going down here to the southeast of Jerusalem, and Gihon, where they, they took, David told uh, the prophets to take his son, that's north of town one mile and a little bit to the east. So we're northeast of town and southeast of town of Jerusalem. There's two different parties going on. Okay, this down here, this is where uh, uh, Adonijah is having his little feast and gathering in Fatica. And up here to the north, that's where David uh, said, take my son, anoint him, blow the horn, and let everybody know about it. And that party is so loud and so going on that it's as though the whole, I mean, the earth is going to split open. Verse 41, and when Adonijah to the southeast and all the guests who were with him heard it. Now, mind you, this party's taking place northeast of town. This party is so loud and the joy is so, so full that down here, another group of people feasting and laughing and eating can hear that noise. And as they finished, when Joab heard the sound of the trumpet, he said, what does this uproar in the city mean? <laughs> and while he was still speaking, behold, Jonathan the son of Abathar, the priest, came in, and Adonijah said, Come in, for you're a worthy man, and you bring good news. Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> no, um, our Lord King David has just made Solomon king. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah. <laughs> That's the oh, snap moment right there. I'm introducing a book and I'm already over time. So how are we going to wrap this thing up? A couple different ways. One, when I read this account, they blow the trumpet and the whole assembly hollers, long live King Solomon. I immediately thought about another trumpet blowing. See, when Jesus comes back, first and foremost will be a trumpet that will blast. And then we will all have the opportunity to say, long live King Jesus. That's, gonna be, okay, that's my own little separate deal. But as we go through this account and story of the promises of God, one thing that happens inside all of us, the reason why we wait, the reason why we're not obedient, the reason why we try to take things into our own hands at times is because we think in terms of fairness, <coughs> equality and fairness. We see things like, that's not fair. Why would you pick one son over another? That's not fair. Why would God give one thing to somebody and not to, that's not fair. And when we talk about fairness, we're making judgment of the character of God himself. And so we need to be cautious in that because what we have is the same God. And our dependence, what did I tell you before, the, the unity, the continuity, the, the continued rule and reign of peace in Israel is going to be dependent on godly wisdom, not man's wisdom. And godly wisdom has everything to do with God and who he is and what he's done. Not in our wisdom. So our conformity is to grow in our trust of him. And our trust of him requires us to look to Jesus to see the epitome of godly wisdom. His word manifested to know and to learn and to transform our lives. And such there's the story that Jesus tells about workers who were all been promised, you know, all been promised a, a full day's wages. And so the workers sign on and they work all day. And then at noon, some other guys show up and they work. And then the, at the end of the day, there's some guys that show up just for an hour. And the owner of the farm actually pays everybody the same amount. A Daenerys. And the guys that showed up in the morning would be like, that's not fair. <laughs> and and the, the owner of the farm just simply says, what are you talking about? You agreed to work for a day's wages, and I gave you a day's wages. Take it and go. Take it and go. And this is what dawns on me. When we start saying things aren't fair, we're looking at our circumstances, and we've lost sight of our greatest gift in our salvation. We want our salvation and more. Our salvation is our day's way. That's enough. But we want more. And we're making judgment of the character of God. He says, take what belongs to you and go. I've given to everybody. Verse 15, and I, am I not allowed to do with whatever I want with what belongs to me? 
<laughs> if I want to give my wages to, if I want to give my money to a guy that's worked the whole day or only a part of the day, he says, he says, or do you begrudge me my generosity? My generosity. And that's who God is. He's generous. Yet when we look at our own wisdom, we think to ourselves, boy, that's not fair. And then we lose sight of his generosity. That's when Jesus goes on. He says, but I tell you the truth, whoever wants to be first will be last, and whoever's last will be first. In this study of the book of Kings and the character of God in, in, in his promise, in his presence, in his power, in his provision, everything's going to be turned upside down from our way of thinking to godly wisdom if we remain faithful to letting God be God and what he's done and what he will do in and through our lives because of his son, Jesus. I'm over time. Please forgive me. God bless you all. Thanks for being here. Talk to you soon. Call me with questions.